Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Conn Report wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you want to find us there, it's Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. Well, today I'm joined by Sam Fortier from the Washington Post. Sam and I will go over the first two weeks of practice. And before I get to that point, I'm going to give you a quick little rundown on what happened in practice Saturday night at FedEx Field. As you can see, I'm still here. You can read Sam, of course, at WashingtonPost.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Sam 4 tr Sam 4 tr And you can read my work, of course, on ESPN.com. I have a story up right now on Jahan Dotson and how impressive he's been in camp. I also sat down and talked to him about some of the highlight plays he made in college. So give that a read. Pretty good stuff from people that I talked about, Dodson, including Carson Wentz, who said that he catches the ball as natural as anyone he's been around. So give it a read, ESPN.com. Again, I want to talk about the practice for a couple minutes, and then we'll get to Sam Fortier. First thing, Curtis Samuel did practice. So this was part of the plan. He was out there, was able to go through all the drills. Had a couple of nice cuts, had a nice cut in the in the red zone, in a red zone drill where he caught a touchdown pass from Carson Wentz. And it didn't look like he was inhibited at all. And he looks like when he's out there, he looks better than he did last year when he was out there. So that's a good sign. Now, the question is, how long will what is the what's the next step? Don't know that yet. How will he be able to practice consistently? And et cetera, et cetera. We're still gonna learn all that, but he did look pretty good tonight. Um the other thing is they, they're they down to four healthy tight ends. So they may need to bring a tight end in here just to get some camp bodies. Cole Turner was out with the left hamstring injury. John Bates still out. Logan Thomas still out. So they were down to four healthy bodies. They'll decide on Sunday whether or not they're going to sign another tight end to provide another some more help in practice. So let's get to the practice tonight. The big thing is still with the offense and the passing game and Carson Wentz, where he's at in his development in this offense and his timing with the receivers, because there are definitely times where he is off. And sometimes it could be poor mechanics. Sometimes it could be a line. I saw this tonight in 111-11 drill where the line just, there was no pocket. He had nowhere to go. In fact, he couldn't even follow through on his pass. So it's going to lead to a high throw. And if you do fall through on that play, you risk slamming your hand on somebody's helmet and hurting your hand. And that's not a good thing. So that happens too. There's also, again, mechanical issues. And you see it sometimes when he's throwing on air that he's just inconsistent. When the coaches talk about it and when others talk about it, and Ron Rivera talked about it after, one of the things they talk about is that he's still getting used to this offense, still getting used to how they read in this offense. For example, there's some plays where maybe in Indian Philly, they would have read it this way Maybe in Washington, he's got to read it this way. So, and I'm kind of pointing my hands on YouTube, kind of going one way and then another for being here. Not every offense reads a play in the same progression. So you've got to get used to that. And that can throw off some timing as well. The other thing that they say can throw it off, and this is natural, he hasn't worked much with Terry McLaurin. So you do see at times, they're not always connecting and sometimes it's behind him. Sometimes it's skipping the ball to him or, or throwing it short of him or something like that. Some of that, some of that, again, can be mechanics. Some of that could be pressure um, from, from the defensive front. And some of that can be getting used to how a guy runs a particular route to the depth, et cetera. So I think they're still trying to get on the same page there. They were on the same page on one throw tonight to cap. I think it was about the 11th play in a, in a full team series. And on the play, uh, Wentz pump fakes and then hits McLaurin on a back shoulder pass. McLaurin reaches over da- or out jumps basically uh, Danny Johnson for the ball. Johnson had good coverage, but a good throw and good timing on the play. The timing is the key because if you get the timing down, I think the throws are going to eventually be there and they won't be as off target as they have been at times throughout these first couple of weeks and especially at times tonight as well. But you still see that, and there's still something they're kind of working towards. So don't panic yet, but I'm not going to sit there and tell you it's been perfect because it hasn't been. But I'm also not going to panic because I do think this is all part of a process. Let's see where they're at in a week. Let's see where they're at in two weeks. And then go from there. If they're at the same point, 
well, then you have to start wondering where things are going. But if it's progressing, that's what you want to see. There, there was another throw that I think when you talk about Wentz, that is something that they really, really like. And it's that quick twitch ability. That's something that I heard from, from team officials way back when, when they started the quarterback search. They wanted somebody who had that quick twitch ability. On this particular play, Wentz is looking over to his left and pump fake. He doesn't, I'm sorry, he doesn't even pump fake. He's going to throw the ball. He's ready to throw the ball. And he, he pulls it back because he sees Kendall Fuller cutting off that particular route. So Fuller is either going to pick the ball or he's certainly going to knock it down. So Wentz can throw, he starts to throw, holds it, pulls it back, immediately turns to a left, his left, finds tight end Armani Rogers there, and with just boom, a quick strike. And it was a good throw. Like that quick twitch ability is something that they're excited about. I think you combine that with some of the speed they have, and it, get, it could give them the ability to make some plays after the catch. There are, like I said, they, they've got to clean some things up here. The offense is still up and down. It's early, and so that's what you that's what you look at. And when you have new a new quarterback and some new receivers, McLaurin was not there in the spring. Samuel been in and out. It's going to take some time to get used to it. There was another throw with Samuel where it was clear there was a the timing was off, and it was a throw over the middle, high throw. But the, um, Rivera felt like it was, some of that was um, with Samuel also getting used to where does he need to be on a certain route with this quarterback. So. A lot of things going on here, a lot of adjustments being made. Sam and I will get into all of this, so stick around. Here comes my conversation with Sam Fortier from The Washington Post. For people watching, Sam and I are both at FedEx Field. We're waiting for the practice to begin, and we wanted to get in different booths to set this up. Been kind of a pain in the butt, so there you go. Like, yeah, we're in separate booths. Yeah, there I am right here. See? You can see me on the screen. So. A little bit of a pain, so I appreciate Sam joining me. We're about half hour or so from the start of this uh, practice. But what Sam and I are going to talk about is really the first week or two, and two of practice, rather than specifically this practice tonight. So first of all, Sam, thank you. Secondly, early impressions from really the first two weeks of training camp. Yeah, I think the first two weeks for me has been about confirming kind of what we expected Carson Wentz to be. Uh, he has some great throws. He has some head scratching throws um, and a lot of times, you know, in the middle. Um, to me, I think the offense and, and the health of the offense, particularly with, you know, right guard Trey Turner, uh, right guard Trey Turner and, and the tight end group, there, there's been some real concern there. Curtis Samuel, obviously, among them. Uh, the defense has looked good. I'm always wary of, of buying too much stock on early training camp performance but the defense has looked good Montez Sweat has been super fired up and I think you know those are probably my broad strokes takeaways from two weeks of camp so let's start with Carson Wentz because he is a quarterback so that's what we're going to talk about and you know it's funny because one thing I wanted to ask you and this is like a some sort of like maybe an esoteric question or something like that there's process versus results right so we're going to see results we're going to see some misfires and misfires, misfires, some up and down. They're looking at process. Where do you think we're at in terms of like how you're looking at this? How much of that do you think is process oriented versus results oriented? And the hard part for us is to know always what are they trying to do on this play? But, you know, is that how do you take that into account when you're watching it? To me, what I've tried to think about with Carson Wentz, even going back to OTAs, was what happens before he throws the ball? Because to me, if you go back and watch his Colts film, if you watch, you know, even the Eagles film, there are just sometimes that he's going to, you know, make a really nice throw and, and sometimes really bad throw. And so to me, it's like, okay, how can we evaluate what he's doing before the ball comes out of his hand? And to me, the biggest thing that stood out process wise is how slow he can be sometimes making those decisions. When he makes quick decisions, most of the time, that's you know, where he's at his best, you know, you see those strikes to Jahan Dotson up the seam, or, you know, you see the out get to Terry and you see the arm strength and all the positive traits. And then, you know, when he holds the ball, you see some of those things that you see in his, you know, blooper reel, I guess, when he threw the left-handed interception in Indianapolis, or, you know, when, when he was, you know, against San Francisco, when he was at the goal line, ended up throwing, you know, throwing the ball right to a defender because he doesn't want to give up on a play. And I know that, Terry and some of those guys talk about, you know, his valor in the pocket, him giving wide receivers chances to make plays. But then you also got to look at the sack numbers and you guys say, okay, did, how much does this hurt? So when he's, you know, a good example, I think was the other day when he was rolling out of the pocket, right. 
um, and Montez Sweat was chasing him, and he said, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. That could either be a taunt or a genuine piece of advice because sometimes I feel like he holds it a little too long. Right, right. And that, that was a funny moment by Sweat, who has been very talkative the last couple of training camps. But again, with Carson, so I asked somebody on the staff, like, hey, is he, you know, what do you, are you con- not so much concerned? I think it, at this point, it's too early to be concerned. I think there is still a lot that he's learning. I think there's still some issues on the line, et cetera. But when I asked a coach something about it, he said, hey, 62%, 63%, 62%, et cetera, which are basically his season by season completion percentages. Then the other thing he said is last three, last three practices, no interceptions. No interceptions. I would say that he has been a little bit imprecise in those interceptions, you know, in those practices as well. We, we talked about this offline, you know, when you see him at his best, uh, it's usually, you know, even if he's having a bad day, he'll play really well in seven on seven when there's no rush, but in nine on nine and 11 on 11, he can get sped up. Sometimes he can make slow decisions. Sometimes I think notably on, on Friday, not to put too much stock into one day, but he, he didn't look even as crisp in seven on seven, throwing a slam right. behind Terry, Great. things like that. And that's not to, to bash him. Um, I'm really trying to give like a, a nuanced view of it. And so, but you're right, you know, for a guy like Carson going into, you know, he, who's a veteran going into, you know, several years in. The 62%, the 63%, what's going to happen in week one really matters. Right. Um, and, and so far, I think we've seen nothing to say, hey, he can't do what he did last year, per se. Right. And I think that's the one thing. That's what I was going to wonder, ask you, too, is, is there, when you're watching him, are you seeing the guy that we've seen the last few years, or are you seeing something else? No, I, I think that I've seen exactly what you would expect to see so far. Um, I mean, even with the, the taking too, you know, taking too long at times, I, in my opinion, to make decisions, when you see him throw it vertically, um, you know, he, he haven't always connected, but when he hooks up with Terry on, on a deep route or, you know, when Jahan Dotson makes a nice, you know, leaping grab down the field or Cole Turner, you kind of see those, those guys that brought in four catch radius. You see what this offense could be when it goes vertical. Scott Turner has wanted to go that way the last two years and yet Washington has had the lowest average depth of target of any quarterback room in the NFL across those two years so if they can get vertical I think Carson Wentz can do that um then I think that could unlock some other things in this offense is the line what is what are your thoughts on the offensive line so far I they've been one of the better groups I'm not going to put a ranking out or whatever but they've been very good I think the last two years and I I think while there's questions about can you replace Brandon Sheriff with Trey Turner who has you know a quad injury where we haven't seen him in a week and and will Andrew Norwell replace Eric Flowers at left guard those are open questions but to me there there's no reason to doubt John Matsko at this point I mean (laughs) <laughs> Wes Schweitzer has, has been excellent um, as a swing guard. Cornelius Lucas, they found guys and really built up a cohesive line. So while I think Carson Wentz will be a lot more challenging than, than Alex Smith or Taylor Heineke in terms of he's not going to break the pocket as much. He's going to throw it deeper. This will be a bigger challenge for this line, but there's no reason for me to doubt them yet. Well, and I, that's one of the things I'm wondering about too. Early in practice, when you're seeing some of the, some of the up and downs of Wentz, how much of that, you know, and sometimes it's a, that D line is, is doing pretty well. So do you look at that and say, first of all, Chase Ruye really not in there. Trey Turner hasn't been in there. Are you, how do you view, how do you process that? Well, I mean, you have to be concerned anytime you're seeing pressure, but then when you kind of peel it back and you say, okay, what are the layers here? To me, it's not concerning if in week one, Trey Turner is lined up at right guard and Chase Roulet is lined up at center. And there's no reason for us to expect that, that they won't be. But if injuries linger or if timelines aren't met, then you start to say, OK, what does the depth of this unit look like? I, I think that even Wes Schweitzer, or Sadiq Charles, you know, kind of their you know, depth on the interior. I think those guys are, are solid. And so to me, I'm not as concerned right now, though, if we get into these preseason games and the Panthers front is doing this or the Chiefs front is making, you know, making the offensive line look the way that Montez Sweat and company have in camp, then yes. Then, then we start talking about, uh, you know, hey, what's the concern level here? And Matsko might be their best position coach. I mean, he's really good. So he's not a guy that I doubt. So that's why I say like some things you have to put into context, what we're seeing now versus what's it going to be like during the season. Has anybody on offense kind of surprised you at all? I I would say, 
I, I don't want to say Jahan Dotson because we knew he was very good coming in, but you know, that, that the hands and, and the big plays are, are for real. I would say that Dax Milne uh, is, is a guy who, you know, when they didn't resign Adam Humphreys, I thought to myself, Oh, maybe they'll envision that bigger role for Dax. And he's had some really nice grabs and, and his row running um, from the slot, you know, Jahan's in there a lot, but to me, it's like, okay, this guy, I think is going to be, I think the sixth or, or, or fifth receiver on this team. I mean, when Alex Erickson was signed on, I thought, okay, is this competition or is this a legitimate right. you know, replacement for Adam Humphreys with more returner value? And I think Dax has kind of stood out uh, Brian Robinson, some other guys, but, but that has, uh, that has uh, I think been, you know, the standout for me. And also returning punts and kicks, which is a big deal, which is could cement his spot. I know they like him, but yes, I think that's a good point. <laughs> And, and they want a dual returner, which they have not had since 2014. So, and he can do both of those things. Right. Um, tight ends. What have you made of that group? And, you know, Logan Thomas isn't practiced yet. John Bates is still up. What have you made of that group? Okay. Midway through my Dax answer, I was like, oh shoot, I should have said Curtis Hodges because the undrafted rookie at Arizona state is, has also impressed me, particularly because, you know, John Bates and Logan Thomas, as you said, have not practiced in camp. And then the other day, You know, you had Samus Reyes go down with a hamstring, Cole Turner go down with a hamstring. So the first team offense was working with Curtis Hodges and Armani Rogers, who played quarterback at Ohio and was undrafted rookie. So to me, Curtis Hodges is that guy, you know, not that we're talking about the fifth tight end here, but I think that he could he could be a guy who could fill in a role if if it takes Logan longer to come back or if Bates isn't ready. Curtis Hodges, I don't know, you know, how refined he is at blocking that's something that he talked to me about that's something he needs to work on but in terms of pass catching legit frame legit hands you know ball skills I think he could he could you know make an impact yeah and I think when you know and I don't know and when I'll talk about him too but I also want to make it clear when people listen it doesn't necessarily mean this year like right. I think that's a guy if, if all guys are healthy he's a he's at best a fourth tight end right but the impact could come in a year or two even no, absolutely. And, and to me, like, that's a big question. You know, when it, Logan and John's timeline, I think those are obviously your top two guys. If, if Samus Reyes is your top tight end, you know, while he has a great story, this is still his second year playing football. And I think he's shown growth as a pass catcher. I, I think he, he, you know, showed a lot as a blocker last year in, in limited opportunities. But I mean, tight end is, is a position that I, I would be a little bit concerned about moving forward. Right. And I will say, like, what I like about um, Hodges, Cole Turner, and Rogers, they're very fluid and they're very, they run like athletes. The hard part with Samus is he's sometimes not as fluid as those guys, but he also can be really good on special teams and as a blocker. And I think the blocking thing is really important because to me, if I'm a defensive coordinator and I see Cole Turner on the field, I am not worried about him. I'm not worried about the run as much. Like if you, if you motion Cole Turner in from the slot, you know, and he's in line, like, okay, you know, and you want to, unless he has help, you know, a chip or a double or something like that, like I I would not have Cole Turner uh, lined up to block a defensive end or even, you know, I I think a blitzing, you know, blitzing corner or safety. I'm going to guess that the play is going to the opposite side of the field. If he's trying (laughs) to block right now, because he's still learning how to do it. Let's flip to the defense would have been, you know, we're talking about inconsistencies with some of the offense and with Wentz. How much do they get credit for that? The defense to me has looked very solid. And to me, when you talk about this unit, I, I don't know if they were as bad as they looked last year. And I think a part of that is the teams they played, the quarterbacks they faced. And also, if you look at the numbers, they were one of the worst pass defenses, especially on third down um, in, in a long time. And so to me, it's, I, I don't think that that is repeatable. A regression is usually something that like football analytics people talk about it. It's like, oh, well, they can't be that as good as they were last year. I think they actually can't be as bad as right. they were last year. And so to me, they have talent. They're working together. It's been really fun, I think, to watch them try to figure out what their three safety set is going to be. Who is that nickel guy? Um, the way that Cam Curl and, and Bobby McCain work with Benjamin St. Juice or, Der- you know, um, or uh, Derek Forrest or, First you know, some, some of those defo. That, uh, the defo, guys are yeah. important some of those other guys that, that we've talked about. So uh, that's been really fun to, to watch. And I'm encouraged, I think, by the communication that I've seen from them as well. I think that's, I don't think that can be understated. And how much, you know, when you, what differences do you, do you see on the field, even in practice because of that? 
there's a speed that they play with. There's a, there's a confidence. I think that you didn't see all the time last year when cam sees something and jumps it. Even there was a play a little bit ago where William Jackson had, you know, so they threw a, a route into the flat to a running back and William Brian Jackson Robinson, first day or first or second day. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's, you remember this too. So oh, not Brian play. Robinson was right in the flat and William Jackson met him, met the ball at Robinson basically. And to me, that's not a play that I saw last year. So William Jackson's confidence, his ability to, to be right there, to recognize and react. It's just, there's, there was, the processing was simultaneous. You know what else I also liked about that play? He lined up because I was watching him on this play. Sometimes you get lucky. So as he against McLaurin, they thought it was man. He he looks like press man jumps to zone, but they played it so well that the that Wentz reads they all like Terry runs a man beater off the line, and you know they all read it. But the disguise, I think that goes back to exactly what you're saying, which is the confidence. I, he's not the only one playing with more confidence back there, is he? Right, and and so to me, like. When we're talking about disguising, that is what stuck out to me so much post buy against Tampa Bay last year. They were able to confuse Tom Brady with the way they use their three safeties. So if Benjamin St. Juice can, you know, lock down the, the, the nickel roll or, you know, if, if it's one of those other guys, like if they're able to be as interchangeable as they were with Landon. And when you're talking about Percy Butler or some of the guys who are younger, that, that's really hard, I think, to replicate. People, I think, sleep on the fact that Landon Collins was a very smart player. Right. And so. Right if you're able to interchange and have that level of chemistry and confidence right away with whomever that guy is, like that would be a huge boon, I think, for this defense. What was a big concern of yours coming in with the D and has it been um, answered or alleviated at all? The, the first one is, can they maintain rush lane discipline, which they didn't last year. I think that led to, you know, a lot some of the problems and can they find a guy to replace Landon Collins? Because like we just talked about with the, with the IQ, can you find, cause the three safety sets worked for them. And yeah. so can you replicate that and can William Jackson get accustomed to zone? And so I think those were my three of my biggest concerns. And the second two, I think there are encouraging signs. They have answered them. The rush lane discipline. I don't think we'll really see right. until they line up against somebody else. What about linebackers? What have you seen? And what do you think? I mean, linebacker, I, I should have mentioned is probably my, my biggest concern, right? Like, Jamin Davis and, and Cole Holcomb, that was not a duo that worked super well. Even if you're talking about Cole at Mike, that was not a duo that worked super well last year. And for them to not address the position was a concern to me. You know, it, Dallas signs Anthony Barr, one of the best on the market. I'm not saying that that guy was necessarily the guy or the right fit. Right, but, right, right. but when you talk about meaningful ways to address this position – I am until we see a different Jamin Davis. And I don't think we've seen that in camp. He, right. you know, maybe he's processing faster, but we have seen no splash plays right. from him. So linebacker remains a big concern for me. And maybe they're right. Maybe they, they know things. I don't know. That's certainly true, but will it lead to results? I'm skeptical and, but, but I'm open to being proved wrong. Right. And I think that's, a, that's still something that bears watching because I've seen improvement or I don't know about improvement in coverage, but you see good coverage skills still, but we knew that. So and it's hard to tell with linebackers until we see him in a game for us to fully see, is he going the right gap? Because then you can slow down the play and you can check all that. Are you confident in what Curtis Samuel will be able to do this year um, at all? Every time that I have tried to guesstimate what Curtis Samuel will do next, going back to last spring, I have been wrong. So I am not going to uh, prognosticate on, on what his timeline is, but I mean, look, like in the healthy 11 on 11 reps that he's had, he has shown an ability to break tackles and ability to gain yards after the catch that this offense sorely lacked uh, last year, especially they, they were 30th in the league in broken tackles last year. So if he can stay on the field, that is a massive if. I think he would bring a real needed element to this offense. But in terms of what, you know, whether he can do that, I, I'm out. Are we overhyping Jahan Dotson at all? Possibly. That's totally possible. If, if, if NFL teams come in and they play press man and they're physical with him at the line and they challenge his strength, I think that, okay, you know, maybe he's going to struggle with that, but man, I mean, there are just some of those plays where, you know, he, the sound when he catches the ball is different. It's quieter. And, and he, and for someone who, I mean, he and I are looking eye to eye. I'm five, nine, five, nine, five, ten. I mean, he does have an impressive catch radius. So 
I mean, maybe we are overhyping him and he's a star at camp and, and, you know, we don't see the results, but man, he's doing a good job fooling us. If so. Is there something that we see or when we're around him that maybe others, it's going to be harder to see that is leads us to maybe not overhyping him, but believing in what he can do. Cause it's not just the hands it's again, process versus results. Maybe, maybe that's what I think what I see with him is process having a plan as a route runner, et cetera, is uh, what do you, what do you think of that? You would know better. You watch, you watch film with the guy. I did. And that's why I say that, but it is, you know, but, but I'm it, teeing you up to plug your story, man. I, well, the, I already will probably will have plugged it before we get to this point, maybe five times, but, but yes, <laughs> in that story, I did watch film with them, but one of the things and watching some film of him from the spring, even uh, going against, these defensive backs, it seems like he has a plan. He seems like he's a more mature route runner, which is why I think maybe you buy into him a little bit more than a typical rookie. To that end, it's impressive to me watching his Penn State tape, some of the option routes that they trusted him to run, that they invested in, that, you know, that's a lot of practice time, especially for guys in college. So to me, he is he has an impressive plan, like you said, and – I think that shows up in the maturity of the route running and, and his ability um, to adjust when, when teams do try to do other things to him. And I think you've seen that kind of show up a little bit that those, I think this is not a Deami Brown situation. He wasn't running nine routes over and over and over again. I mean, this is a guy who has a mature understanding of the route tree, not to knock Deami, but that's something he had to learn in the league. Um, and so I I'm curious uh, whether Jahan um, has a little bit of a, an accelerated adjustment period. Two more questions. First one, um, after a couple of weeks, are they about who you thought they were? I mean, we're not even in the preseason games, but at this point, is this the t- is this what you were expecting to see? Yes. I mean, I mean, the the glass half full measure on this offseason, uh, them not, ad- you know, addressing linebacker or doing much in free agency, them choosing a lot of upperclassmen in the draft. You know, you kind of wonder about the ceiling when you're talking when you're long term, especially when you're talking about that sort of approach to an offseason. But to me, this is about where I would have expected glass half full. Okay. Last thing, do you have anything you want to plug? And before I, before you answer that, so I was going on to Sam's Twitter feed before this to find <laughs> a story. Like I want to help the guy plug it. You know, he's a young guy, he's struggling and all that. So I went on his feed and he comes over and finds me on his feed and he hits a like button on one of his tweets. So if you see a like by me on one of his tweets, that is not from me. But anyway, <laughs> Sam, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, I, I would just say that uh, there's a couple of cool projects in the works, but what has been published, uh, I would say Antonio Gibson, I wrote about his maturity. Yes, you're you seeing it. One. Yeah. You're seeing it not only in, I think, in his frame, he's thinner this year, he's leaner, I should say. Um, and, and I think that you're seeing that his mom is seeing that his coaches are seeing that he has a 14 month old daughter. I think that if, you know, if you go check it out, um, do a story about the, the maturation of him as a third that year guy. A story. That was, that was a, a month or so ago, wasn't it? All right, I'll hit you with five bucks for saying that it was a good story. I appreciate it. It was a good story. <laughs> yeah, there was there was sort of a, a follow-up to that I did last week where Antonio talked about he wanted to report to camp at 220 to 225. Right, 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 right. Because right. his weight kind of – he sometimes his weight can catch up with him, right. um, especially if he's not eating right. Eating was a, a big thing for him in the spring. In the summer, he said – he wasn't able, you know, with all the traveling that he did, he wasn't able to 100% be on it. So the day before camp, he told me he was in the low 230s. But, you know, my understanding is for a guy like that who has more power-based speed right. than twitch-based speed, being a little heavier, a big frame guy, that's okay. But I know that he wants to get even a little leaner, um, you know, before the season starts. And I like how he's running through the hole, lowering his shoulder a little bit shoulder a little bit more. I also like how you interviewed her, your, his daughter and you said, you asked her who's going to win the rushing title, and she said, "Dad, Dad." So I think that was pretty cool too. So, yeah, anyway, Sam, thank you very much for coming on. Always enjoy the insight. Appreciate it. Of course, thanks as always, Kyle. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Sam for joining me, and thank you as always for listening. Washington is off on Sunday, so I'll be back on Monday with another practice report. We'll talk to you next time.